the Haymarket Affair. Um, I am not sure if a lot of you know what this is, but we're gonna uh, we're gonna go through it. I've been, I've been doing this thing. This is part of a series that I've been doing, uh, where I've been talking about a particular labor strike that we saw in America in the last 200, 300 years uh, that I think is important. And uh, the primary focus of it is what we can learn from this history, uh, the mistakes that they might have made, uh, the positive uh, changes that came out of it, and uh, and why we should support labor movements in general. Now. Uh, everybody knows the the kind of the famous story is there was a bomb and a, lot, a bunch of people died and this was a violent revolution. But is that true? Let's find out if that's actually true. So uh, this actually starts back in 1884, two years before the actual incident takes place. Right in 1884, the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Union, the FOTLU, I think is what it ends up being. Uh, the acronym ends up being right, uh, which th these guys, the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions, eventually become the AFL. I think everybody knows the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. Um, they called for this massive national strike um, in 1884 to happen on May 1st, 1886. It gave them two years to plan this national strike to happen. Right. And what were they striking for? They were essentially striking for an eight hour workday. That's what they wanted. They wanted an eight-hour workday. So for two years, you saw a bunch of these little strikes pop up and get disbanded. Uh, for two years, you know, people were people were holding up signs and slogans saying things like uh, eight hours for rest, eight hours for work, and eight hours for what we will. Um, they shorten, shorten the hours, increase the pay. These were sort of the slogans that you were seeing uh, that were leading up to Haymarket, right? Now, part of the some of the organizers, there was a bunch of organizers because a, a strike like this, um, when you want to see something this large, you, you kind of got to, you know, you, you got to see a bunch of um, people organizing it. So some, some of the organizers uh, uh, of note, uh, Albert Parsons, um, who founded the International Working People's Association and his wife, Lucy Parsons who was a free slave and she organized the sewing strikes, uh, the, you know, people that were, uh, sewing, uh, I guess would be a sewing strike, uh, not a sewing strike. It wasn't, it wasn't her just being like, we're done with lawsuits. No more lawsuits in America. We will not litigate or, you know, that was as you guys get it. You guys understand where I'm going with that. Uh, so finally, after two years, you know, they they organized and they got people um, excited about this thing. And, and we finally got to May 1st, 1886. Um, the day rolled around and you and nationwide there were demonstrations right from you, you, Michigan to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, uh, 80,000 people, 80,000 workers uh, nationwide, uh, you know, stood up. And uh, and said that they were were tired of being overworked and underpaid, and what they want is an eight hour workday, and uh, and they don't want their pay to be decreased with this eight hour workday because in some places that was part of the problem is that they gave them the eight hour workday, um, and then they cut their pay. So, you know, these guys were like, you can't do that. The the jobs are more dangerous; they're more demanding, and. You know, and this was sort of the, uh, the the crux of even in 1835, which we talked about yesterday, the 1835 strike in Philadelphia was talking about a 10 hour workday. And eventually now it's like, OK, eight hours seems to be the right amount of time. Uh, it's one third of the day. We're asking for one third of the day to be work. The, the other two is, uh, you know, for for us, um, 80,000 people supported it. Uh, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And this is also 1886. The population of America was far smaller than than the population of America today. So you know that's a that's a good chunk of change. Uh, so on May second, uh, Albert Parsons went to Ohio to organize a march, and Lucy Parsons stayed in Chicago to peacefully organize uh, a, a march in Chicago, and she got about thirty five thousand people uh, together to do this march. It's pretty impressive. 35,000 people just in Chicago alone. So this thing, I mean, this thing was big, right? Um, so 
two days, very successful. Uh, a lot of marches, a lot of demonstrations, a lot of strikes happening, a lot of public, uh, a lot of people kind of joining in solidarity. Even the people that, uh, you know, when, when the strike started, the the scabs that were, um, you know, uh, uh, taking, go, going to work instead of the regular workers, uh, even they started joining the, the strikes. By the end of the first day, they were like, yeah, well, this is kind of fucking bullshit. These guys are fucking crazy. Uh, you know, these guys are a bunch of bastards that are trying to, you know, overwork us and underpay us. Uh, so we're coming to you guys. So, you know, there's a lot of like crossing, um, crossing over into the picket line kind of thing. Uh, so May 3rd, this is where things kind of start getting crazy. And this is where the history books won't talk about it, right? Like this is not the type of shit that you would learn from any sort of corporate history book. Um, is May 3rd, McCormick Harvesting Machine Company in Chicago. Uh, there, there was a strike. The strike was organized um, and everybody was kind of on guard about this strike, right? People were kind of getting a little uh, uneasy because they had the, the uh, workers at the McCormick Harvesting Machine Company had gone to strike in February of that year, in February 1886. This is this is May, so it's it's three months later. But that February strike had uh, had violent results because the Pinkerton guards um, were called and they and they you know attacked the strikers essentially, which is which is basically the pattern of operation when it comes to these strikes, right? They, there'll be a nonviolent demonstration. You know, they they come up with their chance. They come up with with standing in solidarity, and then um, you know some armed forces, deputized citizens, uh, police, army will be called, and they will fire and attack the the the, the citizens and, uh, or the strikers, and they'll provoke them, and then they'll be like, "Look at look at the violence these strikers are causing. These are they're crazy. They're violent. They're crazy." You know, when you don't go to work, and when you're not when 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 you know people's freedoms aren't restricted by labor, and not paying them enough they get violent that's what happens that's why the bosses need to control and manipulate you because you're violent animals and the bot when you get money you become more civilized when you ascertain more wealth you just become more civilized but you guys are not civilized enough to ascertain that wealth so we have to control it for you so that and that's how that's the rhetoric <laughs> that's used against these strikers so um there's a guy by the name of Augustus Spies, I think is how you say it. It's spelled Spies, but I think it's pronounced Spies. Um, he was a German radical socialist organizer. He, he was described as an anarchist. He had his own, uh, you know, anarchist pro-worker uh, paper at the time. Uh, he was at the May 3rd strike in front of the McCormick uh, plant, right? And he basically said, no violence. Everybody just chill out. Stand, in, stand, your, stand your ground, but chill out. Don't, you know, don't get violent. Uh, against e e de these folks. Um, now there's cops there, there's guards there, um, you know, because, because again, that's just, that's just what, what they do. When workers ask to be treated like human beings, uh, the, the oligarchs and the rich and the bosses use the cops to try to murder you. <laughs> They're like, you want humanity? Oh, I'll show you how much humanity I can take away. You know, like that's that's the way that they that's the way that these kind of things work. Uh, so the workday ends. You know, the horn goes the, burr, the horn goes off. The scabs start coming out, and the strikers rush the scabs. Uh, the cops freak out immediately as they see the strikers coming. They open fire. Uh, they killed two of the McCormick workers, and uh, and of course. You know, word starts spreading around that the the strike has become violent. The strikers are now inciting violence. That's what they're doing. Um, now, Spies uses his newspaper, the anarchist newspaper, and basically says that the workmen should take arms. That's what he puts out there. He's like, the we should we should arm ourselves um, in lieu of protection because look at what happened. You know, with the with the McCormick strike. Uh, they're they're firing on us. They're killing us. You know they and they did that even before they they called these guards. These guards got violent. They attacked us, and there was all this uproar about it. Oh, look at these strikers! They're getting violent. Look at them, fucking violent. Knew it. I knew it. You know they just don't have the money to be civilized like us. You know we use seventeen different kinds of spoons. 
Uh, and But we only touch one of them. The other 16, they're for decorative things because we're civilized. So, uh, you know, the, the funny thing about this is when the working class, when people like Augustus Spies are like, hey, you should take arms in terms of self-defense uh, because they're, because the establishment seems to be getting violent towards you, uh, there's all this uproar. But there's never any uproar when the establishment says, yeah, you know what? The working class should take up arms to go fight our wars. Nobody, nobody, you know, says shit about that. Nobody freaks out. Nobody freaks out when the establishment is like, yeah, we should sacrifice the life of, of poor people so that, you know, some fucking congressman can get richer because of his oil lobbies, his investments in the oil company. Like, that's, that's fine. When the establishment calls that for, for arming poor people to go fight their wars, that's fine. But if, if the working class people decide to arm themselves in self-defense, oh, shit. Oh, shit. This is, oh, my God. Is it communism? Is that communism? Is the right to bear arms communism now? So all this stuff happens on May 3rd, right? And people are kind of freaking out. So we get to May 4th, um, you know. Uh, a day that uh, we don't we don't remember Haymarket, but we will remember Star Wars. Uh, things did not go as planned. They did not go as planned. Uh, the previous day's violence scared off a lot of people. You know, um, basically, the organizers of the strike had planned May Fourth to be sort of the big like culmination day um, of things. And uh, they had organized a bunch of speakers. They were expecting 20,000 people to show up at, at Haymarket Square. And because of the previous day's violence, a bunch of these speakers canceled. Uh, the crowd was down to 2,500 instead of that initial 20,000 that they were predicting it would be. Um, it started late because they had to substitute a bunch of speakers, including Albert Parsons, who was arriving, um, you know, that day back to Chicago from Ohio. So it was a long day's journey, but they, but he was like, fine, I'll, I'll speak. Um, there was a, uh, there was a Methodist preacher that was also going to speak, you know, probably how, uh, talking about how Jesus was socialist. Um, and the only time that he incited violence, uh, was in the face of cheating bankers. Uh, so really, you know, the, the church should be against, uh, the banks but they're not because well, tax incentives. Uh, so uh, everything started late. It was supposed to start at 7.30. Didn't start until 8.30. By 10 p.m., the crowd had dwindled even down. It was, it was, it was raining. It went from 2,500 down to 200. I mean, it was just not looking good. And uh, as, as the final speaker was going up, the, actually the preacher was talking at this point, um, the cops got a little nervous and people were like kind of starting to disband anyway. And the cops got a little, they freaked out and people, you know, the strikers saw the cops and the cops started firing at the strikers. They had repeater rifles um, and they started striking. They, they started firing back and then uh, all hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. Right. Um, the strikers were unarmed at this point. And uh, and this is where things pop off, because eventually a bomb goes off, a homemade pipe bomb with dynamite, and a and a time stick pops off. It explodes in the path of the cops. Um, seven cops died. Uh, only one died as a result of the bomb. The other six that were that were killed and the dozens that were injured were from friendly fire because when the bomb went off, everything went into chaos and nobody knew what was happening. So the cops were just firing everywhere blindly. Uh, the history books do fail to mention that uh, four, four strikers died. No one talks about that. Usually when the story is covered um, and I, and I saw this through, through like the history channel, for example, um, or history textbooks, you know, what they talk about is that, the bomb went off probably by a striker. That's usually what they say, even though there's no evidence behind it. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, there's no evidence behind it. Uh, no one knows where this bomb came from, who set it off or who made it. There was no, you know, the investigation wasn't really done. And uh, they only talk about the cops that were killed. They only talk about the cops that were hurt. 
They don't talk about the the workers that were injured. And most of the most of the injuries and most of the uh, you know most of the people that got that got shot were the strikers themselves because the strikers were unarmed. Even though Augustus Spees was calling for the workmen to be to be you know uh, armed, take arms so that you can defend yourself. A bunch of people didn't come armed. A bunch of people still wanted it to be nonviolent. They still wanted to show solidarity. Uh, you know, through 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 civil disobedience and those actions. At the end of it, what happens the day after on May fifth, uh, Chicago goes into martial law, and they run an investigation. Uh, in, they they charge eight organizers, um, and then in August, four of them are sentenced to death. Four of them do get killed. Uh, one of them commits suicide, and two of them get released. So. Um, What's kind of the problem with this, right? Where, where, where do we go from here? Um, the police infringed on First Amendment rights. That's what they did. They, uh, they attacked people that were there to peaceably assemble, and um, that's their right. They're allowed to peaceably assemble under the First Amendment. They are also allowed to petition the government under the First Amendment. Um, you know, the textbooks don't talk about the violence from the cops. They don't talk about the 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 reasons why uh, these guys were organizing and, and gathering uh, at Haymarket. They don't talk about the fact that this was for an eight hour workday, um, and you know they don't talk about the fact that the First Amendment was was uh, was violated by these cops because in the education system that we are under, it's far more important for you to realize that anybody that strikes against the bosses, anybody that goes against this, this corporate regime that we have is a bad guy. And that you should always listen to authority. You should never question them. They're, they're making you a model employee. That's what they want you to do. They want you to go in, punch that clock, do what the fuck you're told, and then you get your pittance at the end of the day. That's what, they're, that's what the education system is built to do, right? Now, the rest of the world celebrates this. The rest of the world celebrates something called May Day. Uh, America does not. Do we celebrate Labor Day, which is not about labor at all? Um, you know, if, if we were actually going to celebrate Labor Day, it would be May 1st. It would actually be all four days of this, right? We would, we would like it, it'd be, be like, here, we're going to stand in solidarity with the workers May 1st to May 4th. We're going to celebrate the worker. We're going to give, you know, consecutive days off or or alternating days off of it to support just to kind of, you know, because you can't have grocery stores and stuff be, be taken off. Maybe May 1st grocery stores, not open, but offices are open, you know, and then you trade off the kind of a thing. It, it, but, but we don't do that here. We don't. The closest thing that we get is May 4th, which is a day uh, about star Wars. We do get that. We do get that. We get, um, we get to celebrate a man that is so rich um, over a story about uh, space ninjas and cowboys um, that that we celebrate uh, that guy. All right, let's read your comments. <laughs> uh, Jen, this is exactly what makes an activist brave. Activists know... What will happen when they get close to taking control back, but we stand up anyway? Exactly. And I think that's what we need to do, right? In the face of, in the face of real um, adversity, we, we stand up. We stand up to, uh, to fight back against injustice. And we know what the injustice is going to be. A at this point, I've been covering uh, strikes for like two weeks or something like that. Um, and, and that's sort of the pattern of behavior. The pattern of behavior is um, they will use their authoritative force against these strikers. Uh, and that is something that uh, when we see the strikes, because we're seeing a lot of strikes these days, we're seeing strikes from Amazon, we're seeing strikes from Instacart, Shipped, um, all these gig economies, McDonald's, I think is, it, these essential workers are going on strike because they are not being treated well by the, the corporations that they, uh, that they work for. And that have said that they will be treating them well. That's also part of it, right? They say that they're going to treat these people well, but they're not. Um, and we have to stand by them. As people, we should stand by them because because the establishment is going to use every um, 
every kind of force that they possibly can uh, to to get in the way, to basically make sure that that uh, that that the working class doesn't get what they need um, until we fight for it. And, and the unfortunate thing is sometimes we might lose some people, and that's the unfortunate thing, and that's sort of one of the things that we uh, know will happen. <laughs> hey, poor people, you want a little chance to prosper? Get your ass out there and be my personal thief. Here's a gun. Don't come back till you have my shit. Now everyone clap and respect the, these poor people who just want to survive. Yeah, that's kind of how they act. Uh, that's kind of what scabs are. Is is they it, it, basically the the reason why scabs are even around is is because and cops, you know, um, they they use they use the police force as, as their own personal army uh, in a lot of these situations. Um, we're, we're probably going to see a rollback on, on these laws, but you know, we have laws that, uh, make protesting illegal in, in a lot of, um, in a lot of societies. So, um, what we see in that regard is average blue collar working class police officers protecting a pipeline or corporate interests rather than the rights of their fellow working class people. Um, and it's exactly what, what you're talking about, Jen, which is upsetting. Uh, but you know what the the big thing I think we can take away from um, Haymarket is how long. First of all, it, it, there was so much organizing that went behind um, making something like that happen. And you know, I think la in the later strikes, you do end up seeing that the violence is not tolerated um, and doesn't become a uh, point of adversity to, 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 to bring it up that way. It doesn't bring up a point of adversity, uh, that when, when the establishment pushes back against violence, uh, we can stand our ground in solidarity and say that we are not going to be afraid of this. There are more of us than there are of you. And eventually, uh, you know, these working class police officers that, that you are using as your own private army, uh, will not stand up for, uh, for, for, for you to use them the way that you're using them. So, you know, I think, I think there is some hope. I think there is some, uh, th some light at the end of the tunnel from, from learning about stuff like this, because that's the reason why I think the hay market thing went as, as crazy as it did is because, um, there wasn't enough solidarity. People were scared and, and rightfully so, you know, violence is scary, especially when you're going to use cops to shoot innocent protesters that aren't getting violent, that aren't, that, that are peaceably assembling. Um, and, you know what? I, what I forgot to mention, it, it, and and I'll mention this, and and then we'll move forward. Is during hey, when, on May fourth, when the cops fired at the at the dispersing crowd, the reason why they they fired is because they said uh, that the the uh, person that was talking to the speaker uh, was, was using inciting language is, is, is what they said, right? Inciting language is, is what freaked them out enough to fire on unarmed, nonviolent, innocent civilians. Um, there were two officers. To, to, yeah, exactly. Eventually the cops are going to, two officers at Standing Rock that stopped and just joined the camp. Yeah, that, that happens all the time. And that was the same thing with, with hate market too, is you can show, the, the striking workers that they are replaceable by hiring scabs, but eventually the scabs will also see how terrible the working conditions are and how you don't give a shit about them and how you're lying to them essentially and demand for the same rights as the, as the striking workers. And in, in this case of the Haymarket thing, they all went and joined it. They all went and joined the, the strikers anyway, or a majority of them did. Uh, and it's the same thing is eventually the cops are going to be sick of being treated the way that they're going to be treated and they're going to come and join your side anyway. It might only be two of them, but that two might spark another three, uh, the, that three might spark another four. And eventually now you have a bigger movement of, of police officers that are coming um, and, you know, joining your side instead of being, being an adversary to you. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. 
uh, and uh, and if you if you have the means to uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and um, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.